It's December 23rd, 1984. Train 904 is en route to Milan from Naples, Italy, as the packed train of some 700 Christmas time passengers is traveling through the Apennine based tunnel in Tuscany. A large remote control explosive goes off in the middle of the train. As the explosion echoes across the train cart, 15 die, and the train immediately comes to an emergency stop. Hundreds of passengers are stranded in the middle of the wintry, mountainous region, with no help in sight and many heavily injured. Una volta che ci va accompagnato, non posso avere i posti, ma uno che batta solo una volta, due volte, tre volte, quattro volte in una vita. Io ho un mezzo per rinnovare i legami tra la mafia americana e quella siciliana. Questi legami erano stati interrotti nei primi anni 50. E allora, siccome in questo francese si è creato il mito legge attraverso i processi, attraverso il futuro. It's January 5, 1905. Michele Navarra is born in the Sicilian village of Corleone, a part of the city of Palermo. His dad was a land surveyor and land owner who also worked part-time as an agricultural teacher. Meanwhile, his mother's brother was a member of the local agricultural mafia known as the Fratuzzi. The Fratuzzi operated mainly in real estate and the men who leased out land at high illegal rates were known as Gabalotti. In 1930, the uncle was whacked. With his connections and money, Navarra pursued a career in both crime and medicine, getting his degree from the University of Palermo in 1929. Over the next 13 years, Navarra would slowly become a captain in the Royal Italian Army. After leaving the army in 43, a 38-year-old Navarra came home to the role of boss of Corleone. He was known as an old-school man, almost a godfather-like figure, pursuing power and respect over money and wealth. He himself never directly murdered anyone, instead sending his soldiers or third parties to do so on his behalf. Over the next four years of the well-dressed Navarra's reign, Corleone saw 57 murders take place. Meanwhile, his political career grew alongside him as he built extensive government connections in corporate roles. He took part in the public election for the role of medical advisor to the state railway company. He won as the only candidate. He continued his career in medicine, using his empire to expedite the process. In 1946, a doctor named Nicolosi was found dead. He held the highest role at the Corleone Hospital, and his successor was none other than Navarra. Following World War II and the invasion of Italy, the crime boss used the scrapped war vehicles from the old Italian army to begin a successful trucking business. He'd been given permission to do so by the Allied forces. Using his role as the town's main doctor, Navarra influenced state elections in a really strange way. At some point in the latter 40s, on election day, hundreds of voters reported themselves going blind, although they were in fact perfectly fine. Navarra created certifications for these voters that stated they needed assistance in voting. He then sent his soldiers down to rig the ballot. He was unstoppable and held a chokehold over Corleone's industries. That is, until a young gangster named Luciano Leggio came along. Leggio was one of ten siblings who lived together in a small, poverty-stricken farmhouse. As he got older, the teenage Leggio would join the local Mafia clan, beginning with petty crimes like theft. At the age of 18, in 1943, Leggio would get his first arrest, six months for a corn theft charge. After leaving jail, he whacked the witness who reported him. In 1945, he became an official member of Navarra's family when the boss recruited him directly to become a family enforcer. At some point that same year, Leggio killed a local farmhand and took the man's role. 
Once he infiltrated the property, he then forced the owner to sign it over to him using a gun. The 20-year-old Leggio was the city's youngest gabolotto, which was an impressive beginning to his long career. On March 10, 1948, local union leader Placido Rizzotto went missing. Rizzotto was an activist who worked with local farmers to give them control over the city's industries by claiming unfarmed properties. His activism threatened the local clan, and Leggio was sent to whack him. The gangsters kidnapped the Unionist, shot him, and threw him into a deep cavern. An 11-year-old farmhand named Giuseppe Letizia was a witness to the crime, and he went into shock upon seeing what had happened. His father rushed him to the local hospital, and there he talked about what he'd seen. Navarra killed the kid with an injection the next day, and the press was angry. The police began to come after the gangsters, and Leggio ran into hiding. Navarro was arrested but not charged, and was sent to a five-year-long exile in Calabria instead. However, local politicians helped him get back home in 1949, while Leggio was tried in absentia, essentially where a suspect is charged without showing up to court. After the men returned home, however, they both began working to strengthen their criminal empire. Navarra joined forces with the local Indrangheta clan, becoming friendly with Soderno boss Tony Macri. Leggio, following his return to Corleone, began working secretly out of Navarra's periphery, running his own rackets without the boss knowing. He began his own mass-scale theft racket that moved stolen livestock in the regional markets. The tension between both men continued to rise after the government issued their plans to build a massive dam in the Belice River, which would cut off the mafia-controlled water supply through Corleone. The main issue here was that the gangsters, namely Navarra, controlled the springs in Sicily as they were private property at the time. With this power, the local mafia was able to exploit the region with high rates. However, Leggio was in full support of the dam, as it meant he could make millions off of construction racketeering. The conflict began to spill into violence, and in the five years following 1953, over 153 murders were recorded at the hand of the Mafia and Corleone alone. It's June of 1958. Local Corleonese mafioso Luciano Leggio drives up to an estate owned by his boss, Michele Navarra. The two have gotten into conflict in recent years after Leggio began to run his own secret rackets with his own crew. Navarra had invited the man to a sit-down to discuss their grievances and come to a peaceful solution. As Leggio walked into the home, he was surprised to see 15 gunmen waiting for him. The gangster fled as the hitmen opened fire, and he managed to get out with only a few injuries. Word of the attack got out to Leggio's crew, made up of his old prison mates, and the men knew they were as good as dead if they didn't strike back. It's now August 2nd of that same year. Navarra and another doctor who worked at the local Corleone Hospital are driving on a silent countryside road. As the men continued down the road, two cars came into view and blocked their path. Navarra quickly hit the brakes as the two men tried to see what was going on. Suddenly, a spray of submachine gun fire flew from all directions, and the gunmen took off with Navarra and his passenger slumped over in the now bullet-riddled car. On September 6, three Navarra loyalists were mowed down in Corleone, and across the next few months, bodies riddled the homes and streets of the city. With the boss gone, and no one to take his place, Leggio would become the violent Iron Fist boss of the local Sicilian clan, and he designated his crew as his top men. One of these crewmates, who had also been one of Navarra's killers, 
was Salvatore Reno. It's November 16, 1930. Salvatore Rina is born into a poor Corleone farm household. When he was only 13, Rina lost his father, Giovanni, in a bomb accident. The man had found an American bomb sitting out in a field, and it was still undetonated. He became excited at the thought of the money it could bring his family. And so, Giovanni tried to open the explosive to separate the metal and the gunpowder before the bomb went off, killing him and Rina's younger brother. As he got older, Rina began to work under the local Sicilian Mafia clan, headed by Michele Navarro. When he was 19, he received a massive 12-year sentence for the murder of another man who he'd gotten into a fight with. While sitting behind bars, Rina befriended Luciano Leggio, as well as a few other men, which included Calogero Bagarella and Bernardo Provenzano. Bagarella's younger brother, Leo Luca, would later become Rina's brother-in-law. After Navarro's murder, the three men became Leggio's right hands, and they worked with him to grow the clan's presence in Sicily and their power in the Mafia. Across the latter 1950s and early 60s, more murders at the hand of the Corleonesi were committed, which included their involvement in the First Mafia War. Across the 1950s, the city of Palermo, where Corleone is located, had seen major economic growth in numerous industries including transportation, real estate, and retail, and the population skyrocketed as a result. The Mafia worked with the leading Christian Democratic Party to lease out construction projects to gangsters, which saw as a result a building boom in the city as well. However, different clans wanted control of the region, and none of them really knew what family was in charge. The first Mafia war began in December of 1962, when Calcedonio de Pisa was whacked. De Pisa was an eccentric young gangster who operated mainly in tobacco smuggling and local real estate. He was aligned with the Greco family, a clan of the Sicilian Mafia that wanted dominance in Palermo and to establish the Sicilian Commission. The night of his death, while walking to a tobacco kiosk, three gangsters approached him and blew de Pisa down with numerous firearms. The warfare raged on between 62 and 63, as shootouts took place across the city. Bombings caused mass damage all over the place, and in 63, a car bomb detonated in the suburb of Kiakuli. Named the Kiakuli Massacre, the explosion killed seven police officers. However, it was originally intended for Salvatore Greco, the boss of Kiakuli. He also ran the Sicilian Commission, a governing body many local, small-scale gangsters were strongly against. On the same day, another bomb went off in Villabate, a Palermo neighborhood, and this one killed two civilians. Greco survived the attack, but as a result of the explosion, the Italian state government began the first anti-mafia commission, and they forced the mafia into hiding. Over the following few weeks, over 1,200 mafiosi were arrested and the Sicilian gangsters declared a Pax Mafiosa, a state of peace between the clans. Things went quiet in Palermo for the next few years. Da parte dei, dei militari, la mia presenza per accertare eventuale accordo. The Corleonesi clan of Leggio and Rina were responsible for many of the deaths during the First Mafia War, after they held a vicious campaign against Navarra's loyalists, murdering many of them. While many of the gangsters went into hiding internationally, including the Corleonesi, Leggio was caught and arrested in May of 1964, while at the home of his girlfriend Leo Lucina Sorisi. Sorisi was originally the girlfriend of Placido Rizzotto, who was killed years prior. They charged and imprisoned the clan leader, but in December of 68, he was acquitted. In 1969, however, Leggio alongside Rina were both charged for the past decade's worth of murders in Corleone. However, due to both a lack of strong evidence and the intimidation of the jury and judge, both men were let go. 
Following the trial, Rena was yet again indicted for murder and went into hiding, and would remain so for the next two decades. Meanwhile, state magistrate Cesare Terranova would appeal Leggio's acquittal and after being indicted yet again, the gang leader received treatment for Pot's disease, which he'd been suffering from across his entire life. On December 10, 1969, Calogero Bagarella would die in a shootout with Palermo boss Michele Cavataio. Cavataio had been a secret aggressor during the First Mafia War and had led a wave of violent attacks that he'd pinned on other bosses in Sicily. Following the declaration of the Pax Mafiosa, however, the region sat in relative peace for a number of years. It was later learned that the Kiakuli bombing was also Cavataio's doing, and the Sicilian gangsters knew who their true enemy was. At a major mafia meeting in Zurich, Salvatore Greco, who was then hiding out in Venezuela, gave his support to the inner clan plan to whack out Cavataio. The Palermo boss attempted to hold a peace meeting with the other gangsters back home, and at this meeting he showcased a map he'd made of Palermo's districts and how he thought the city could be divided by clan territory. However, if this map was to fall into the wrong hands, it would expose the entire operation in the region, and unknown to Cavataio, this sign of peace and reconciliation was actually his final straw. On the fateful December day, a hit crew made up of Bagarella, Provenzano, and a few more men walked into a construction company office in Palermo, where Cavataio was standing with three of his men. The hit squad began to open fire on their rivals, and Cavataio pulled out his firearm and brought Bagarella down. Provenzano managed to get Cavataio with the Beretta submachine, and as the killers fled, they left over 108 shells in their path. The hit job was a major one, as Cavataio was a feared force in the city. All of the hitmen were high-ranking gangsters who already had a number of deaths under their belts. However, aside from ending the decade-long struggle in Palermo, it would solidify Provenzano's career in the Corleonesi clan. While Rina was in hiding, Leggio continued to run the Corleonesi. In early 1971, he had two men kidnapped. Antonio Caruso and Giuseppe Vassallo, both sons of powerful regional industrialists. He held the men for ransom as a form of extortion. Then on May 5th of 1971, state magistrate Pietro Chaglione was whacked after returning home from his wife's tomb in Palermo. He'd been killed under the orders of Leggio, and as a result, 114 gangsters were arrested. Leggio went to hiding and was arrested in Milan in May of 1974. In 1975, he got life behind bars for numerous charges, including the Navarra case, and although he had influence over the clan, the real power went to his second-in-command, Salvatore Toto Rina. When Leggio got life in prison, Rina became the new boss of the Corleonesi clan, and the early beginnings of his career were marked by a wave of bloodshed unseen in prior decades. In 1977, acting on Leggio's orders, Rina had Italian Lieutenant Colonel Giuseppe Russo whacked, and two years later had a local judge murdered as well. For years, Palermo had been the central headquarters. First was Stefano Bontade. Bontade was the young, rich, and brutal leader of the Santa Maria de Gesù family, headquartered in Villa Grazia. As a mafia boss, he had strong connections to the Italian state and Sicilian government. The First Mafia War had led to the collapse of the Sicilian Commission, but in the 1970s, following Cavataio's murder, the governing body was reunited. On the board sat Rina, Bontade, and a number of other bosses. The idea behind the reuniting of the Commission was to be able to peacefully come to conclusions and settle disputes, thus keeping the Mafiosi under the radar. However, Leggio and Rina had other plans. 
In an effort to isolate the Palermo families, the Corleonesi decided to take out their rival's allies first. In 1978, two Italian bosses were whacked, Giuseppe de Cristina and Giuseppe Calderon. De Cristina was the Iron Fist boss of Riesi, a commune in Sicily's Caltanissetta province. In 1975, after becoming boss of Caltanissetta, the Cristina also joined the Interprovincial Commission, which operated between the different provinces of Sicily. He became angry at the Corleonesi after the murder of Colonel Russo, as Russo was actually one of his confidants. The commission had never given their consent for the attack, and had in fact rejected the Corleonesi's request beforehand. After seeing their open defiance of Mafia tradition, the Cristina knew the type of people he was up against. Unlike the other families in Palermo, the Corleonesi were especially brutal and openly public about what they did, as a means of scaring not only the police, but also the other families. On November 21st, 1977, Corleonesi hitmen opened fire on Cristina, who managed to evade them and survive, although his two most loyal lieutenants died in the process. In an act of retaliation, on April 8, 1978, Francesco Madonia was whacked. He was the boss of Vallelunga Pratameno, another commune in Caltanissetta and ally to the Corleonesi. The Cristina became more paranoid as time went on and decided to become a federal informant. He went to the Carabinieri on April 16, 1978, and laid out the entire conflict brewing in Sicily. He explained how the Corleonesi had infiltrators and secret hitmen, and how the gangsters were becoming so successful due to their aggressive, reckless style, which undermined the old-school traditional Cosa Nostra. On May 30, 1978, the Cristina was gunned down by Corleonesi hitmen at a bus stop, a murder which was committed in the territory of another Palermo boss. That way, suspicion would fall on his shoulders and not those of the Corleonesi. In the next few months, many of the slain gangster's family members would be attacked as well, and many of his old supporters left Cosa Nostra to join the Italian Maltese Stida, rivals of the Sicilians. The next man to go was Giuseppe Calderon, the boss of Catania. He was named secretary of the Interprovincial Commission, but was vying for a spot in the province against Benedetto Santa Paola, an ally of the Corleonesi. On September 8, 1978, Calderon was whacked, and his role went to his rival. The other gangsters knew something bad was quietly brewing, and that it was only a matter of time before a full-blown war exploded into the streets. In February of 1980, high-ranking Bontade gangster Tommaso Buscetta walked out of jail and immediately fled to Brazil. He'll become important later on. In 81, following Calderon's death, the crime boss planned Rina's death. Michele Greco then leaked the plot to Rina, and on April 23rd of that same year, while driving home from his birthday party, Giuseppe Greco, one of Rina's hitmen, ambushed Bontade and blew him down. And the Second Mafia War was kicked off. Ma ecco che all'improvviso Buscetta introduce un elemento nuovo e lancia un'accusa bruciante. When Calderon and the Cristina were whacked out, the leadership structure of the commission shifted dramatically. Gaetano Badalamenti was the boss of Cinisi in Sicily, one of the highest ranking members of the commission. He was also a part of Bontade's faction, and in 78, he was forced out of the commission and his own role back home. Badalamenti fled to Brazil as Michele Greco took his spot on the ruling body, and another one of the Corleonesi's rivals was now gone. Salvatore Inzurillo was the last of Bontade's faction that stood against Rina and Leggio. Inzurillo was the boss of the Paso di Reggiano family of Palermo and operated heavily in heroin trafficking. In 1980, Inzurillo had prosecuting judge Gaetano Costa, whacked after the judge had helped bring down the crime boss's heroin network earlier that year. Costa was killed in the territory of Giuseppe Calo, an ally of the Corleonesi and the boss of Porto Nuova. Costa's killing served three purposes. For one, it was an act of revenge. 
For two, it was to show the commission that if the Corleonese could get away with unsanctioned hits, so could he. For three, however, it was to turn the Corleonese's tactics against them. The gangsters had been known to murder their rivals in rival territory, so Inzerillo opted to do the same. On May 11, 1981, while leaving the house of a mistress, Giuseppe Greco whacked Inzerillo. During the late boss's funeral, his son Giuseppe Jr. vowed to avenge his father, and shortly afterwards, Greco kidnapped the teenager, tortured him, and killed him. On May 26, 1981, Inzerillo's brother Santo was whacked at a meeting. Later that year, his other brother Pietro was found dead in New Jersey. Over the next two years, the Mafia War in Sicily raged on, and with the highest ranking leaders of the rival faction all gone, Rina was unchallenged as he began brutally coming after their allies, family members, and associates. Rina went against all traditional Mafia rules and openly murdered members of the government and law enforcement. Anyone that stood in his path, including civilians, became a target. On April 30, 1982, Pio Latore, the secretary of the state's Communist Party, was whacked. In May of 82, Carabinieri General Carlo Alberto della Chiesa was sent to Sicily with the main goal of dismantling the mob. On September 3rd, della Chiesa, his wife Emanuele, and his bodyguard Domenico Russo were all murdered in a public shooting in the city center. Later that same month, Filippo Marchese went missing. Marchese was a family hitman who led the neighborhood of Corso de Mil in Palermo. He was close to Giuseppe Greco and a strong ally of Rina. Marchese was known for his excessive violence during the Second War, running an apartment in his neighborhood known as the Room of Death, where enemies of Rina would be whacked. Across the war, over a hundred victims died at the hands of Marchese and his secret apartment. However, by 1982, as the war died down, the bosses decided that Marchese's violence was no longer needed and, if anything, made him a clear threat. Marchese was led to a warehouse in Palermo, and there, Giuseppe Greco and two other hitmen whacked him in the same exact way he did it to so many of his victims in the past. Rina then claimed that the hitman had accidentally shot himself as a way to save face. On November 30, 1982, Rosario Riccobono, the drug smuggling boss of Partana Mondello, was whacked. Riccobono was a high-ranking member on the commission and an ally to the Corleonesi, siding with them during the Second War. In fact, he'd been one of the central actors in the conflict, himself murdering many of Greco and Rina's enemies. However, Riccobono used to be an ally to Bontade and Inzerillo, and following the conclusion of the war, Rina decided that a man who'd so easily turned on his allies in the past could do it yet again, and he okayed a hit on him. On that fateful night, Riccobono and eight of his associates all went missing, each strangled. A few days following, three more of his allies were blown down, and his brother was found dead in a brutal scene. On September 11, two of Tommaso Buscetta's sons went missing, and he knew exactly what had happened. Over the next few months, his brother, son-in-law, brother-in-law, and nephews were all killed under Rina's orders. By 1983, the war was over, and the Corleonese emerged victorious. In the two years of warfare, over a thousand people were killed, and the gangsters' rivals in both Palermo and Greater Sicily were wiped out, the remaining men either in hiding or living in constant fear. Rina held the region in a major chokehold. On October 23, 1983, Buscetta was arrested in Sao Paulo and extradited to Italy in June of 84. Now back home, he requested a meeting with anti-mafia prosecutor Giovanni Falcone, and following some legal talks, he became the highest level mafioso to flip. Over the next 45 days, Buscetta exposed many important details regarding the Sicilian Mafia's inner workings, explaining the structure and organization of the gang, and with his turncoat testimonies in hand, the state had what it needed to come after the Mafia in a major, concentrated effort. In October of 1984, heroin trafficker Salvatore Contorno flipped as well. He had been arrested back in 1982 while on the run from both the Corleonese and police, but after seeing Buscetta flip, he did the same. A week following, 
Over 127 mafiosi were arrested, and a major-scale investigation began. It's December 23rd, 1984. Rapido 904 is moving through the Apennine based tunnel in Tuscany, Italy. The train is packed with some 700 Christmas time passengers traveling from Naples to Milan. Everything is running as usual. At 7.08 p.m., however, a remote explosive is detonated in car 9 at the center of the train. It goes off, immediately claiming 15 lives as the shockwave moves through the tunnel. The operators put the train into an emergency stop, now stuck too far into the tunnel. The conductor manages to get to a phone and calls for help while the passengers are stuck in the cold, mountainous region. Emergency services struggle to get to the horrific scene, while the crew tries to aid the injured passengers under limited visibility. About an hour and a half later, the very first rescue people arrive. Unknown to them, the severity of the scene. The tragic bombing was organized by Giuseppe Callo, under the orders of Reno, as a way to distract the authorities from his operations. The idea was to divert their attention to the attack, and have it blamed on political terrorist organizations. Attacks like this were common during the Years of Lead, a violent period in Italy that lasted until the 1980s. However, this backfired, as it was clear who had set the explosive off. On November 8, 1985, over 707 indictments were issued by state judge Antonio Caponetto as part of an 8,000-page long report labeled the Maxi Trial. 476 Italian mafiosi were sent to trial or had their trials issued in absentia, including Rina, Leggio, Calo, Santa Paola, and Greco. Another charge was issued for Giuseppe Greco, who had gone missing in September of 1985. It was later discovered that Rina had ordered two of Giuseppe's crewmates to whack him. The boss then claimed Greco was hiding out in the US as a way to avoid any blame while simultaneously weakening the Chiaculli family. Alfonso Giordano was chosen as the main judge while two alternatives were selected. The defendants were locked in a massive, underground bunker with walls thick enough to stop a missile. Hundreds upon hundreds of charges were brought against the Sicilians, including over 120 murders. The Maxi trial was single-handedly the most significant blow to the Sicilian Mafia in Italian history and the largest trial in the world. Bernardo Provenzano and many other men in Rina's circle were tried in absentia as the court case continued. Leggio was acquitted of a 15-year long charge for murder while Rina got two life sentences. He was in hiding, however, and as such, the charges couldn't be actually applied. In December of 87, Callow received 23 years behind bars, and in February of 89, was charged for the train 904 bombing. He got a life sentence, and his role went to Salvatore Cancemi. At the end of 1987, Santa Paola got life in absentia. He was on the run, and was caught in hiding in May of 1993. On September 25th, 1988, state magistrate Antonino Sayetta was whacked. Three years later, government prosecutor Antonino Sciopoliti was whacked as well. The Maxi appeals began following the trial's conclusion and lasted for years. By December of 1990, many of the charged gangsters were fully acquitted. On February 27, 1991, Michele Greco was acquitted and let go, but got a life sentence a year later. Many of the acquittals were overturned, and many of the gangsters went back to jail. In 1993, a Sicilian hitman named Baldessare Di Maggio would change things in the region when he flipped to the state. Di Maggio was born in November of 1954 in the town of San Giuseppe Giatto in Palermo. In 1981, when he entered his latter 20s, he became a made man under the Mafia family of Bernardo Brusca, a Corleonese ally. He held a major role in the Second Mafia War as one of the men who helped eliminate Rosario Riccobono's clan for the Corleonese. In the latter 80s, Brusca and his son Giovanni were both exiled to Lenosa, 
and DiMaggio became the family's acting boss. However, the Bruscas returned in 1990 and wanted DiMaggio out of the role, and as such, Rena, wanting to avoid unneeded infighting, called both sides to a peace meeting. However, DiMaggio and Rena had been in conflict in the past year after DiMaggio had left his family for his girlfriend. Rena had told him that due to his disloyalty to his wife, there was no way he could ever really be a boss. After being called to the meeting, DiMaggio feared for his life and went into hiding. In January of 1993, DiMaggio was arrested for an illegal gun charge. He immediately flipped and over the course of a week, helped the authorities track Rena down. Rena's charges were finally applied to him and the boss of the brutal Corleonese clan, who'd been in hiding since the 1960s, was now behind bars for the rest of his life. His role went to acting boss Bernardo Provenzano, who worked alongside Leo Loco Bagarella. With this new era of leadership, however, the Sicilian Mafia would enter one of its most violent periods, the mid-1990s, and the Corleonese clan would begin to fall. 